Welcome to Ideas at Work, a podcast featuring conversations with scientists, academics, writers, and thinkers who are influencing our time. I believe the world has changed. Those ideas that we once thought to be true will now be viewed through an entirely different lens post-COVID-19. What I'm interested in discussing is the emergence of this new normal. What changes? What stays the same? What slips into the annals of history? And most importantly, my viewpoint is anchored in two things. One, in organizations. What's the role of the company in these new and turbulent times? And secondly, what are the main ideas we need to consider or reconsider? So I will not be talking to interesting people with interesting viewpoints who have done interesting things, but rather diving into conversations with people who I think are propagating the most important ideas that inform our current situation. Today, I'll be chatting with Wendy Carlin. Wendy is Professor of Economics at University College London and Research Fellow of the Center for Economic Policy Research. Her research focuses on macroeconomics, institutions, and economic performance, the economics of transition, and economic knowledge and education. As such, Wendy is leading an international project, the CORE project, which we, I hope we'll talk about later, which has the exceptionally ambitious aim to reform the entire undergraduate economics curriculum. She is a member of the expert advisory panel of the UK's Office of Budget Responsibility, and she has co-authored three macroeconomic books. And in 2015, she was awarded a CBE for services to economics and public finance. You should know, Wendy is very interested in how we think about the economy and public policy, not only in an academic environment, but also in the everyday vernacular by which people talk about their livelihoods and their futures. I suspect after COVID-19, there'll be a great sorting, a sort of dividing line, a BC and an AD, if you will. And there are some ideas and thus some organizations will wither and others will prosper. There are questions we need to ask ourselves. Among them, are there ideas that can make sense of what seems to be an emerging economic paradigm? One post-COVID that is less individualistic, less based on the conception of humans as perfect rational actors. One that sees more opportunities for collaboration between entities such as governments, private enterprise and communities, entities that previously were deemed antagonistic or irrelevant to one another. As organizational people, we need to ask ourselves, what is this new paradigm? What are its properties, its narrative, its function? And how does it allow us to build better organizations, including companies, countries, communities, and a better, more flourishing civil society? Well, we have no better guide than Wendy Carlin. Wendy, welcome to Ideas at Work. It's a pleasure. Oh, great. Now, um, do you agree with my thesis that, that, that COVID is actually a time, a historical time, an epoch-changing time? Yes, I think it is, uh, and I think it fits very well with the other epoch-changing uh, crisis that we are in the midst of, and that's the climate crisis. Hmm. So the contrast, I think, is very interesting because COVID came, for most people, out of left field or you know out of nowhere, um, a health crisis, a health pandemic, so not an economically generated crisis. And then we've got this other more slow moving, but no less uh, serious and urgent climate crisis. And I think the two come together in helping us to think about how we have to reconceptualize the way that the economy works, the way that economic policy is designed, and the way that we talk about our, the way we live our livelihoods and about our futures. Hmm. You know, just as you're noodling, I, I hadn't thought of the connection to the climate crisis, but would you add a, a third crisis potentially, a, a, like a social justice crisis that I, I feel like we're also experiencing around the world? Yeah, ab absolutely. So, uh, and and I think so. It's something that's very striking is that if you if you go into a classroom of new fresh undergraduates uh, in an economics class and you say to them before you've done anything else, you say, "What's the most pressing problem that economists today should be addressing?" overwhelmingly, wherever you are in the world, the answer that comes back is inequality. Right. So it's, it's, it, that is indeed uh, very striking that it's on the minds of, of all these students. And then they, the other very kind of common uh, problems that they refer to relate to climate, climate crisis. And I know, and we, we actually have an example of a class that met in, in Siena just before the lockdown and uh, coronavirus was um, mm -hmm. uh, popped out. So it's a good place, it's a good kind of testing ground to see what the big problems are 
and to look at it through the eyes of young people. And, and so you look both through the eyes of young people and through this orthodox teaching of economics. And, and I, I believe you've come to the conclusion that this orthodox teaching of economics fails, uh, fails us in our understanding of actually how things are currently working. Do you, you want to discuss that a bit? Yeah, it, yeah, it really does. So um, the way that the way that uh, just in one image of how economics is is now taught, the image is of someone shopping. I realise that's rather ironical given that I'm talking to you, but um, but but that image that economics is shopping is uh, mm. is, is a way of thinking about the the picture that students get so they're really kind of focused on very small problems like whether to choose to to eat uh, or to spend their their money on pizza or beer for right. example right so that and and uh, it, it so it's a combination of small problems and abstraction which is a is a really bad idea huh. if you're trying to woo uh, to entice people into into studying economics, which has the capacity to address really big problems, big important problems, those ones that the students mentioned, and it can help tool them up with some analytical equipment that will allow them to step back from those big from the complexity of those big problems mm -hmm. and think about the causal structure, uh, begin to ask questions, to pose. Um, to raise hypotheses and then think about the data. So I, th I think we can move to make economics a subject which really engages with the big problems and teaches the economic tools that help you to get insight. Yeah, no, excellent. So it's um, about really liking economics. It's, it's right. uh, we're trying to get people into it. Um, and I think now we have a way of teaching it that can serve that purpose. Great. Yeah, I mean, uh, even I don't see humans just as consumers. Um, talk about no, of course, because you're interested in organizations. So. Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but but even a unidimensional view of humans, even as organizational creatures, seems to sort of dwarf our capacity for understanding who we really are. Talk a little bit about your your conception of what sort of orthodox economics has taught us about who humans are and what this emerging paradigm suggests we are. Yeah. So the the orthodox view is that, um, and it, it sort of became cemented very firmly in from about the middle of the last century, hmm. was that that economics should really reduce the scope of its ambition, hmm. and it should concentrate on the so-called Homo economicus. So this was a a, a, a forward-looking, so someone who could look infinitely far forward mm -hmm. and could take um, rational, self-interested decisions. So that that's the that's the model, and that really confines the the scope because it um, and, and the way it was was kind of expressed was was that that economics could be the queen of the social sciences right. by making the domain of its study solved political problems. Right. So right. Take out power, take out other motivations. Right. And you end up with a kind of emasculated homo economicus. Right, right. Um, you know, I, I have come to understand your work to the extent that I do through the Santa Fe Institute, which of course is dedicated to complexity, but it was it was formed by Nobel laureates both in economics and physics. And, and they seemed explicitly to reject the view that you just outlined and suggested that there was an, an, a more uh, complex, both in a in sort of in the vernacular sense of complex, multifaceted, but also yeah. also complex in, in a more technical sense that, that, that how we model agents, how we model behavior, um, how we are deeply entangled. Do you want to talk about your relationship with um, Santa Fe and why you think complexity is actually part of this new paradigm? Yeah, so uh, I've become involved um, in, in, with the Santa Fe Institute over the really over the period during which I've been developing this new uh, economics uh, project, which is a, is a global project. But one of the, the architects is uh, Sam Bowles, who's, mm. who directs the behavioral sciences program 
and has been at Santa Fe for a long time. And his his way of thinking is really kind of deeply embedded in the culture um, uh, at, at SFI. And he brings this very deep understanding of human behavior um, based on a lot of experimental work. So uh, conducting experiments with small scale societies around the world, really ga gathering evidence on how people behave. And one of the famous um, experiments that that he and collaborators have conducted is the so-called ultimatum game, mm -hmm. which asks uh, someone, say you, to to divide up a hundred dollars, and you, it's just you and me yeah. playing it, and you can decide on the split. But if I don't accept the split, we neither of us get anything. Right. So how much are you going to offer me? Fifty bucks. Ah, there you go. Right. So I accept. <laughs> so we have a deal. But Homo econ economicus, if yeah. you were playing Homo, you'd offer me one cent. Right, right. Because that would make me, and you'd expect me to accept because that would, I, with one cent, I'd be better off than with nothing. Okay, so that just shows you how uh, this move in economics to, uh, to, to undertake experiments has come together with some of the other kind of um, founding ideas at SFI to produce a much richer understanding of the economy. And uh, the, 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 the SFI approach to economics, we have lots of debates about this, and there are people there who, um, who are very committed to the idea that, uh, that a different way of modeling using agent-based models is a very good way of gaining insight into uh, how 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 the economy works, and I think that's that's true. That's going to help us understand some things like how housing markets work, how bubbles can grow and and burst. So I think it's part of the picture, but I think there are lots of other parts of uh, modern economics that really help us to construct this integrated understanding, mm. which I think is you know we're we're on the path to an integrated understanding. Yes. Yeah. I am um, th that ultimatum game. I, I have heard that there you have different responses based on on your culture. For example, there are different average responses, at least. And maybe the fifty dollars. Maybe I was I was signifying my Canadianness, Wendy. I don't yes. know if that's if that's what happened there. But uh, it <laughs> about forty dollars is about the typical. Is it? Offer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But there uh, are differences. There are you know if you compare students with farmers, for example. Right students are less uh, make small offers than farmers say huh so that's even within the same society that's with us data but then if you look at um yeah societies around the world you do get you do get some some differences but but they're, they're nothing compared with the homo economicus right. prediction no no society anywhere is anything like that and that's that's very telling right that 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 no matter how individualistic or collectivist you are you are still very far from what the classical model suggests yes. is, is predictable yeah that's that's as telling as 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 can be um you know so i i i stumbled upon your um your some of your most recent work with sam in a lecture that you gave that i found completely arresting and I, i'll tell you a little bit of the story why i found it so arresting I, I was frustrated myself with um, some endeavors I'm working on with the Canadian federal government to, to build a program where we can help uh, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Canadian businesses get online, those that aren't currently because of, and, and of course they're suffering because of lockdown and et cetera, yeah. and hiring thousand potentially Canadian students to help them do it. And everyone thought it was a good idea, but it was really clear to me that there was no um, there was no ability for the relevant entities to work together. It, it's like they didn't have, and, and here's the tell here, that in, in, they didn't have a narrative, they didn't have a metaphor, they didn't have a model. There was like, there's no heuristic, there's no shared language to say that governments, private sector and civil society should work in some collective way on a problem. And everybody I ran into, it was very funny because everyone thought it was a great idea but it, it was like there was no process in which we could follow. And I drew a triangle of government, private sector, and civil society. And in the middle, I said, there's got to be what I called an idea space where we have like, you know, in case of problem, break glass and insert process and protocol here. <clears throat> well, 
I, I watch your talk with Sam and you have drawn the exact same diagram. So uh, <laughs> what I stumbled into in a, in a, <laughs> in an irritated Eureka moment, tell me about the, tell me about the science and the deep thinking behind it. Well, um, yeah. Okay. So I think the, the, well, rather a kind of simple way to begin is to just think of a one dimensional space. So just a line right. um, and at one end there's market and at the other end there's government right. and policies are kind of lined up uh, along here. But more importantly, as we think about what it, what is it that characterizes each of those poles mm. and, and the, at the market pole, then ac actions or actors are motivated by material incentives. Right. Okay. And uh, outcomes are implemented by prices and competition. Mm -hmm. And just as you were sort of suggesting, that is extremely helpful in some for solving some parts of some problems. Right. And then we think at the other end of that single continuum we think about the government and so again we think uh, what's what are the, what what's the motivation for action there well it's compliance with with state authority and the the actions are implemented by fiat mm -hmm. and, and by elections so uh, we and we can think of like a tug of war and, and actually much of the covid debate has been about you know pulling things along this single line and saying you know, it's state capacity that really matters. Right. And we, we're going to, uh, we, we're really focusing on, for example, the role of uh, government um, as the insurer of last resort. Mm -hmm. So that's that line. Yep. But then, you know, your uh, your third pole, which which we, we call civil society or community mm -hmm. as well. So let's do the same thing, which is to think about what are the motivations that uh, characterize action around there. So there we're talking about, Reciprocity, so exactly in our game, our ultimatum game. Yep. Um, altruism, fairness. Yep. So you know, I would have rejected your lousy offer if you'd made one. Mm -hmm. You knew that, so you didn't make it. Um, right. Sustainability, uh, identity is down there as well, mm -hmm. and we might come come back to that. Um, and those those are implemented by social norms mm -hmm. and the exercise of private power. So mm -hmm. power within organisations. So for just to make what I mean by that clear, so when we think about an organization, your organization, you know, when when someone's reallocated across the organization, they don't go there because of some change in market prices. Right. Right. They go go there because you decide in some probably wonderfully collective and collaborative way that they're going to do better I in see. this I other see. spot. So we've got this, you know, this uh, triangle like yeah. that. Yeah. And and the the space inside the triangle mm. is is where we can place policies or like the one you're talking about. Right. And what we're saying is that we we then want to mobilize the capacities from each of the three poles mm -hmm. for what they're good at. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for the complementarity of what the state's good at, what the the market is good at. And what civil society is good at, right? And that, when we think of that kind of expanded space, instead of just thinking about kind of this push and pull along the blue line at the top, yes. And we, we, I think we're we're much better placed to understand a lot of how the economy actually works, but also to think of your idea space. How can we imagine how it could work better? Yes, exactly. Okay, so lots to dig into there. So a couple things I, I realized I may have, uh, you know, the first diagram I drew may not be identical to yours. In the market space, I had I had place sort of private enterprise, but you suggested actually maybe belong in the third pole. As a matter of fact, oh, no. So I think it's very interesting. So where so where private enterprise uh, is operating in the market, yes, then it's at the market pole. I think. But if you're thinking about things going on inside the enterprise, then obviously you've got the exercise of private power. And that's where we see things like, you know, Amazon workers being forced to work in unsafe environments. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's that's happening inside the triangle. Yeah. I, so you, you can simultaneously belong to all all corners of the of the triangle. I, I that's yeah. that's clear. Thank you. That's clear, clear to me now. Um, 
So here's a hard question. <laughs> so, you know, one could argue that this, this model is replacing a sort of neoliberal model. What, what do you call this thing? Ah, no, that's your job. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we need to, yeah, we don't have a name okay. for it. So, um, but yeah, so if we think back historically, we have kind of a classical liberal paradigm, a Keynesian social democratic paradigm, right. and then a neoliberal paradigm. And they've kind of followed each other and and one's given way to the next as the economy has changed and made it irrelevant. Uh, so, we, yeah, we do need a good name. We right. need a sort of advertising agency to think of a... Right. A <laughs> it's just a, just a random thought here. When we were, we were in the era of classical liberalism, did we call it classical liberalism then? Or only post facto did we, did we look back and historically name it that? Yeah, I think that's true. I'm not the I'm not really a very good historian of, yeah. of political and economic thought, but you know you're right. Um, if we take the 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 Keynesian social democratic paradigm, then those those words were. I think people also talked about New Deal paradigm. Yes. So uh, that was definitely a contemporaneous assignment. Yeah. And maybe maybe it would help just to kind of. Um, explain the kind of layers of each of what a paradigm is made up of and then that can help all of us help sort of try and construct this new one exactly oh i'm super keen in this yeah please tell us about about everything that you think goes into an economic paradigm from metaphor okay. to narrative to yeah yeah okay so 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 it, it i think the, the way to think about it is in four layers so at the bottom you've got the normative foundations or the normative for ethical foundations. So let's just take the classical liberal one to begin with to, as, a, as an example. So in that one, you've got, um, you've, got, you've got freedom, you've got the idea of, uh, of equal dignity. So this is, this is a, an idea about um, people being, if you like, liberated from hierarchical um, very narrow parochialism. Yep. Um, uh, and, and then um, <clears throat> on top of that, you've got an economic model. So first is the normative foundation, then comes the economic model. The economic model associated with cl classical liberalism, we think of in terms of, of uh, Smith and Mill, and we think of, of, of specialization and comparative advantage, uh, markets, um, Operating to take advantage of those to uh, to uh, for enterprises to work at scale, for example, to you know expand the scope of the market. So that's the economic model, and already you can see that there's a there's a mutual engagement of yes. the ethical foundations and the and the economic model. Yes. And then there are um, emblematic policies that go along the third layer. And that's uh, things like the repeal of the Corn Laws, mm -hmm. or uh, um, uh, regulating against chartered monopolies. So, kind of anti-monopoly policy, um, focusing on the benefits that arise from competition, um, uh, getting rid of tariffs, and so on. That's all. And again, they're all mutually reinforcing. And then there's a an, an, a way of talking about it, and that was, you know, the the classic Adam Smith. Um, uh, description of the the brewer and the baker yeah. um, uh, working in their in each of their fields for their own interests, and then producing this this sort of amazing outcome for for uh, society and the economy. So that's the that's the everyday the everyday speech, or or Alice talking to the Queen of this is all done by everyone minding their own business in yeah. Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's the paradigm. This four. That's like that's super useful. Do you think it matters, uh, or do you, or is there research on this that w one of these happens in sequence first and then affects the other? So, for example, um, Adam Smith would have probably not seen himself as an economist, but as a moral philosopher. Mm -hmm. And and so, do we yeah. do we stop start at the bottom or move move to the top, or is there an emerging narrative that starts at the top and diffuses to the bottom? Yeah, I think that's that's a uh, that's an interesting question, and that you know I, I haven't really seen a very good historical um, analysis because, and which now you could do actually because of you could use 
uh, machine learning right. to with textual analysis. So you could use you know everyday documents, novels, and so on, and you could so you could trace the uh, the sequencing and be much clearer about you know which which of these occurred first. But I think you know they emerged together, as you say. Right. So so Smith was you know he could do everything. The, the, the and also the the primacy may not matter, and I bet you that what the research yeah. would tell us that there there is a an emergent sort of zeitgeist where all these ideas sort of accrue gel. accrue yeah, and gel to one another. Okay, excellent. So that's classical liberalism. Yeah. Um, yeah so then we have like uh, the so then there's the problem, right? Yeah. So classical liberalism, and then we have the problem of the Great Depression and and a crisis because there's persistent. Uh, mass unemployment and it can't be accounted for by the economic model right. of classical liberalism. So that's the kind of genesis in the world of the uh, emergence of the Keynesian social democratic New Deal paradigm, which uh, has has different different kinds of values like security, for example. Right. Um, and uh, and the idea there is that uh, that. The economic model, you couldn't have a, 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 you're thinking, you're sort of jumping ahead and thinking, well, I know about the policies, the sort of Keynesian policies, but you couldn't have the Keynesian policies that would deal with the, the possibility of lasting unemployment if you didn't have the economic model mm -hmm. and the concept of aggregate demand, which was Keynes's great contribution. So they, they really do fit together. And then you have the, the way it was talked about um, in terms of, uh the 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 cause of the the depression was that people were unable to buy the goods because they didn't have jobs they didn't have incomes and then that was resolved in the war where the government war finance provided uh demand and then in the uh in the in the post post war period governments were committing to that framework so even and, and committing to it was as important as actually doing it. Right. Because once you created the expectations that the government was gonna support demand, then the private sector was uh, willing to, to implement its investment plans based on those growth expectations. Right, right. It's, um, okay, so, so then we have this period of great affluence, of course. Uh, yes, the golden age. Golden time. age, sort of 1945, 1970. Was that yep, rough? yep, that's roughly right. But, and then we and then we get to a, a new age, a sort of a, a, a neoliberal age. And so what yeah. are the ideas, the paradigms, the, the narratives? Yeah, that so, so that, again, we have to think about, you know, what went wrong in the world because right. it has to be something that that provides the kind of material foundations of changing ideas and beliefs. And there was the, the Wendy, end of the golden age. Wendy, can I just stop you there? Because I, I think that might be, it certainly seems to be more important to me than, than, uh, than the way we're sort of passing over it. Like it, 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 these are not ideas in abstract mm -hmm. that, are, that are suddenly better ideas. These are, these, this is a very evolutionary approach, which says when the circumstances change, the tools we use to flourish change as, yes. they, as they should. It's it very much, yeah very much a, a complexity evolutionary approach to to an environment yes yes i think i think that's right um so you uh, and it's all, all, also i think interesting to think about the run up to the crisis so so thinking of the uh of the the end of the the golden age um you could say in a sense that it 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 there were some of the seeds of its it, it the seeds of the next crisis were in the very success of the um, of the Keynesian New Deal. So there was a lot of confidence about high employment, and what that produced was was the the stagflationary period right. um, in the nineteen seventies, and and that created the basis for a big uh, push against uh, big government. Mm -hmm. So that sort of uh the the um the reagan thatcher yep. um, uh, revolution but that was based on a on a on a, on a logical coherent paradigm right. so based on different values so a negative view of freedom freedom from government interference yes and then a model which was really focused on this homo economicus but expanded it it's out of 
uh, individual transactions in the market to governments so that now governments were purely self-interested and civil servants were, were purely self-interested as well. So it was a model of self-interest in the large right. um, and of, of competitive clearing markets. Right. So get the government out, let the market do its work. That was really the... So we had the normative foundations, the economic model, and then the policies were things like privatisation, deregulation, uh, vouchers for, for schools, negative income tax. Um, and then the, the way it was talked about was, was yeah, the, the, the gov government that governs best governs least. Right. Uh, Maggie Thatcher famously says, I believe there's no such thing as society at this point. Yes, yes. She certainly, she rode back on it, but yes, she was certainly... Yeah quoted as saying that yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and and the reason it kind of took hold so again sort of a bit independent of whether she really meant it is that it captured people's imagination because it captured the zeitgeist as you as you referred to it yeah yeah so okay so I, I love this so we now have a we now have a model in which we can view economic history at least the last <laughs> 250 years of Western um, yeah what what is the emerging crisis um, yeah. that is push that is requiring a new ideological tool set. Yeah, so that I think that's interesting because it also takes us back to back ten years mm. and says uh, actually, well, we did really have a crisis that we thought was pretty bad then. Right. Uh, the financial crisis. I know that Canada had a had a rather um, muted crisis because mm -hmm. it it had a had a sensible banking system. But that wasn't true for many other parts of the world, and you you experienced the crisis. But it, but the the interesting thing there was that the in the run up to to the crisis, there again there was this sense of sort of complacency, and you know it was the great moderation. We'd solved this problem of inflation. We'd had independent central banks. We were there was this general view that uh, that. There wasn't any need to intervene, even though maybe it looked like a bit like a bubble or a housing bubble was emerging. Um, just, just uh, let 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 it play, and and then the what happens in a situation like that is that that uh, there's a tendency for market participants to take more risk, and uh, and that's exactly what created the circumstances for the financial crisis. Right. So then we had this massive financial crisis. And that is when people started to say things like, hmm, well, we should blame economists and economics is really not up to much. And so the sort of big movement for being very critical of economics, I think, can be traced back to, to the financial crisis. Now, for you, did you have like a professional personal crisis with this or did you already see the sort of problematic nature of how economics was was behaving with these ideas? Uh, I th it was very important for me, um, the, 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 the financial crisis, because it made me realize that I had to understand the financial system and the interaction between the financial system and the macro economy. And those things had been separated in economics. Right. So I you know, spent a lot of time building macroeconomic models that in lots of ways were very good for understanding what had come before, right. but uh, were wholly inadequate in, in facing or uh, giving us the tools to think about why a financial crisis had emerged. So that was like a wake-up call. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I have, um, you know, in my uh, cursory examination of history, it seems like pandemics and plagues are often acts of revelation in that they reveal the institutional rot in the societies that they afflict. Um, yeah. Do you think? Do you think this emerging paradigm would? Do you think the the, the COVID nineteen has really been a catalyst to many people thinking very hard about what the future should look like? Yes, I I, th I think it I think it has been because it's been it's it's really like a shock. It's a shock to every every country. It it really highlighted the interdependence of the world. Uh, it sort of came as you say, like it came from. Uh, I mean, we now know that there are a lot of vulnerabilities to a pandemic. Right. But I think it has acted as 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 a as a real wake up call, and partly because it's it's been this extremely intense 
experience, common experience of people being shut down, locked away in their houses. And they have, they have experienced uh, extraordinary acts of generosity, of cooperation, of communities solving problems. And I think it's made people realize that uh, just conceiving of this as just a move from the market to the government isn't good enough. Right. And I, I wholeheartedly believe that. So how do we, how do we, how do we begin to make a narrative that people see the possibility of this emerging idea space? What what do you suggest normal people to do, or organizational people, or people like me? What, what do you suggest? Yeah, so I think that the the narrative is coming out of our own mouths mm -hmm. when we talk about what we what we've experienced over the this period, uh, and when we talk, for example, about who who are the essential workers. Right. So we see right there that market prices don't correspond to value right. in terms of how we. You know, even officially, they're like official documents that say this is the list of official workers. Uh, sorry, of essential workers, and they're often lowly paid. They're often black and ethnic minority workers that, who are, it turns out, more susceptible to this virus. So it's kind of surfaced many things about uh, the way that the, that the economy operates and where where these. Um, uh, things that have to be in the triangle. So exercise of private power, for example, the, the role of private, uh, sorry, of social norms. Mm. So we know, and we can look around the world, that people have responded to the pandemic in ways that are not because of governments ordering them to do it. Right. And in a lot of cases, even if you look at the United States, mm -hmm. um, uh, then you can see in every state that people responded to the the shutdown before it happened. Yeah, that was. But people were thinking, wasn't it striking? I I, I saw that data and it was phenomenal. And, and so the, yeah. I think we're talking about the same data. Which and this wasn't just in the U.S. No, nope. uh, but it was it was everywhere. People are responding prior to government uh, uh, dictate, which is which yeah. is which 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 says this this. Third component, civil society is far stronger. It's real. It's it's not a, it's not an abstraction, and and, yeah. and people behave in that way. You know, th this also brings me back to um, you know our our epistemic foundations again, Wendy. In that you, you talked about value and essential workers being sort of misjudged or misvalued just on by by market standards alone. Hmm. How, how do we get an emerging reevaluation of values in this new paradigm? How, how should we value essential workers now? Yeah, so so we have to have a we have to have this kind of conversation, right. um, and we have to begin to think about what kind of organisations are going to solve our problems. So, for example, our care problems. This is a huge part of the economy in in your economy and the economy I live here in, in the UK, um, and we know that those problems. Even though governments tried to privatize these things, we know that many of the problems that have emerged in the pandemic have been in care homes. Right. And it people have been, you know, working extraordinarily hard um, under very difficult circumstances. But but it's revealed that these uh, these organizations are are not fit for purpose. Right. And that we we really have to rethink, you know, how how do we how do we value the care of older people? What's the role of government in setting the, the framework? But how do we involve um, more community organ uh, community organ organizations mm -hmm. uh, at, at a local level to... So uh, one of the things that's become very clear in this country is that having those essential workers moving from care home to care home has been an extraordinary virus spreader. Yep. Um, but they have to do that because they've got to do it to get the their the money to have a bare bare essential uh, living standard. Right. So a much clearer way of thinking about you know localizing where where those relationships uh, take place would be you know would be much better in terms of public health. It would be uh, be able to provide a more satisfying job. 
for for workers and then we have to think about the the financing and the financial implications and who bears the burden so these are complicated problems mm. but they have to involve you know the three poles it's i'm i'm just noodling how uh, you know allowed in my head the implications of your model with care because it is it is such a, a fundamental crisis again starting with our fundamental like with some assumptions around the things we value mm -hmm. i I've, I've heard it said that the way we treat old people in our society we will deem in 50 years the way we consider now the, the poor treatment of the lgbt community for example that old people in our society are in general that ostracized that out of center and that yeah. and that it, it isn't a surprise that COVID-19 has hit them this hard because of systemic um, decisions we've made. So for example, if if we if we had a greater I'm just I'm now replaying what you've told me, Wendy, just to make sure I'm getting the gist of it. But if we had, for example, a greater sense of solidarity between ourselves mm -hmm. and 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 elders, maybe we would lobby the government for tax incentives that would allow us to build granny suites and so that people wouldn't have to live in care facilities as much. Yes, yeah, sure, exactly. Or there may there may be uh, much better ways to have perhaps to have care facilities, but to have them locally based, and so to create relationships at a local level with families, but also with children. Yeah. So you know, this idea of putting um, elderly people into an institution where they're very isolated from from young people, and and you know, the, these things are just require a different way of thinking and they require bringing to the surface a different set of values right yeah i've read i've read academic papers and uh, and popular press papers about mixed living environments that are are far more beneficial for the flourishing of everyone involved children old people and you know and and again this goes back to some of our epistemic foundations about who we are as human beings mm -hmm. You know, we, we are not just rational actors who can be atomized and, and divided. We're actually deeply integrated. And and when we are divided, we feel very um, alienated from one another. And I think one of the interesting thing that's emerged in the, in the COVID crisis is that the discussion of values um, in, in the popular discussion in, in the press, in the media, um, but also um, by us as, as as economists. So for a long time, you know, the idea was economists shouldn't really touch values or normative things. They should be left to someone else. Um, but but we're facing everyday normative questions. You know, we have to make decisions about, you know, our students and how, how should we grade them when, you know, they've been sent off wherever they are and we're only dealing with them online and some of them have terrible uh, a situation for study and others have brilliant situation and you know how do we make sure that we're we're setting fair exams well that's not not a very comfortable zone and and I think that it's come because it's emerged in so many aspects of our life during this crisis we, we're we're in a in a situation where we can um, mobilize those um, those motivations mm hmm Let's maybe touch on your students for a, a little bit and your core project. Uh, tell me a little bit about like what that curriculum looks like, how it differs from orthodoxy, and wh like what are the main components? Yeah. Okay. So it, it first thing is that it's very global. Mm. So it's global. It's created by a, a great big group of um, economists, researchers, teachers from around the world, all contributing their time uncompensated. And we've produced this, these fantastic uh, ebooks, which are free online, uh, interactive, best, uh, you know, best in class, if you like, um, of for ed educational materials. And the the so so the production process has been very different. The delivery is very different. Mm -hmm. And and then what you're really asking about the content. The content is very different. Mm -hmm. So for example, where we begin. We begin with a Moroccan traveler wandering around the world in the 14th century. And he notices that uh, the living standards in the regions that he visits are very similar. Now that is, for most students, well, they've never known that. They've never thought about that. They've always just thought the world was the world they see with these huge differences in living standards. Right. 
um, across regions of the world. And so we, we want to kind of uh, place them in this world where for hundreds and hundreds of years, nothing happened right. to living standards and they were pretty similar right. on average. And then suddenly something happened. And so we kind of rivet their attention on uh, what we call the hockey stick and this the move to continuous improvement in living standards. Mm. So we start with like a giant question and then we look at some data and then we step back and we say, well, how are we going to understand this? And that's the method. So all the way through the course, we motivate the learning of economics with a big complex question. And then we step back and we create some what economics is very good at, mm. some simplifying lenses to interrogate the problem and to give us a way of thinking about it. So with the, the hockey stick, we say, you know, why did it happen in England, you know, not France, et cetera, et cetera? Why did it happen in the 18th century? And then we can look at what happened to the relative price of labor, so wages and coal. And that changed in England, but nowhere else. Right. And so that gave the motivation for uh, introducing um, new methods of production, energy intensive methods of production. And, you know, you get, you go off on the industrial revolution. Yeah. So, you know, there's some economics, there's an economic model, but it's being kind of motivated by this huge question. Yeah. I, this is a course I would like to take. I don't know if it's a MOOC, if it's help open. Yourself. No, you can help yeah. yourself. It's um, in fact they they used it on a uh, marketplace, um, an NPR uh, radio program. Yeah. For the first three months of this year, they were doing a unit a week, and all the readers were following along. Yeah. So you can actually read it yourself. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I, I mean personally, I feel like I mean I I love just your pedagogical approach of big questions and then interrogation, but also I I think your description of everything's the same and then the industrial revolution came along is maybe the rem most remarkable feat humans have mm -hmm. ever discovered. And, and it's seemingly not talked about, it, it, you know, and, and cause the implications are still going on now, because if you, if, if you line the hockey stick up, it does go great Britain. And then really quickly, almost every other country mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. follows in lockstep. And yeah, and, and you, you know, can find the ones that don't go, yep. but you can also do hockey sticks for carbon emissions. Yes, for right. Do hockey sticks for the speed at which news travels, so for technology. So you can uh, you can use this this device to really you know kind of sort of blows your mind when you first see all see all see all of this data because it suddenly allows you to think, wow. I'm beginning to understand how the world came to look the way it does today. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, and of course, as, as you very well know, there's both good externalities and bad. There's infant mortality sinks, yeah. literacy goes up, carbon emissions. It really is. Well, that's what a fascinating um, intro to economics. Um, okay, so what, what should companies, what should companies do with this information in this emerging paradigm? Do you have any advice? Oh, well, to, yeah, I think it's fascinating. And so I think for, for economists, um, tr taking this, you know, which, which is a sort of an abstraction and, and thinking about how it applies to a particular problem. So we've already talked about aged care. We could talk about um, uh, defunding the police or, or uh, the, the change today in the pro probation service. But we can also talk about um, a, a company and think about you know what what are the uh, what are the normative foundations of, of the company? What's the company trying to achieve? Right. What, what how does that how does the company see its it, its purpose and and its relationships with with uh, with its uh, with its workers? So you know the internal relationships, but also with the market um and with it and with its with it with its customers but in some sense you know what what's the point of it mm -hmm. it's presumably not just to uh, maximize the return to the shareholders right yeah well i mean i can tell you in our case it, um we have a couple of conceits so one of them is 
uh, we want to make commerce better for everyone. So in there is a couple statements that we think, obviously, I think there's a normative statement about the benefits of commerce, but also yes. about everyone that, that there is. No, a but yeah, that, and you see, that's crucial. So this idea of, um, of opening access right. and allowing, for example, a much broader spectrum of people to innovate. We need innovation. We have to have innovation to solve all these problems we face. Right. But right. at the moment, lots of people can't play in the innovation game because mm -hmm. they have no, they have no resources. They have no collateral. They can't borrow. They can't set up a small business. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the and the other way I think that we see ourselves, and I think this is again an emerging idea that many companies we see ourselves as a platform and an ecosystem, so that we. We prosper and flourish in aggregate with all of the stakeholders. So, so back to your, you know, Friedman-esque comment about shareholder primacy. It, it's one that we don't think is correct in the abstract, but it, and it's certainly not correct in practice. I can tell you, as a C-level executive of a publicly traded company, what you care about is all the stakeholders, and and that's really so. That means partners. That means suppliers. That means our merchants. That means their customers. Um, and and I think. Practically, that's what organizations have always cared about, frankly. Uh, yeah. You know, there's an ideological overlay that I think maybe people felt the need at one point to pay lip service to, but that's also disappearing as well. But I think there's, there's also, in, at least in some settings, there's a pressure for, uh, for quarterly reporting, for example, yeah. for, for a really short-term uh, orientation, which can somehow and and certainly in a narrative seem to absolutely outweigh any any of these kind of broader and richer senses of purpose I, I think that's changing too so another conceit that we have is that we want to last 100 years okay and and so we say that often to ourselves because it actually ensures that we make long-term decisions and, and get away from quarterly results of course as, as i'm sure you know there's lots of debates going now about what does the stock exchange really mean in the market? Is it is it a short term mechanism? Like right now, the as you know, like many of the stock markets haven't budged much. Is, is that evidence that it's actually taking into long to a longer term because they know a couple of years will be a write off? It's a, it's an interesting dynamic, but um, it's it's one we've always really avoided. We, we've said like our, our stock price is not our real price. We're in for yeah. a hundred year game, and and that forces you to make long term long-term decisions. And again, I don't think that's going to be unique to us. I think many organizations are going to, are beginning to operate on these principles. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's that's very exciting and very encouraging. And, and especially for the, the, the other crisis that we touched on, the climate crisis. Right. And, uh, you know, 100 years, to last 100 years, we have to get through the next uh, 10 or 20 years. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we, we facilitate uh, shipping a lot of shit around the planet. And, oh, and, yes. and, and that's, that's, a, that's a problem that we feel like is not an externality. That's a problem we need to start to solve as well. Because, yeah. because we live in an ecosystem, because we're a platform, et cetera. Right. And so these are, these are subtle metaphors and narratives that I think are suffusing all of sort of private sector talk. Um, just, just as we're we're coming to time here, with with this new paradigm, what what potentially gets better? Well, I think you've used the term flourishing, mm. and and I think uh, that that what it offers is is a way of bringing together people's uh, working lives mm. with with their sense of of being a person, and for too many people. Those things are just have, are just separated. They 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 have to work right. in order to live, but it's not part of their being a person. Right. So so I think it it's this uh, that that that's the that's the idea. Yeah, yeah. And what do you think is the biggest impediment to the adoption of this of this new idea? I think one big problem is that when we think of that third. Uh, that third pole down the bottom, the civil society. Yep. This this is also where identity lies, mm -hmm. and uh, in 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 group identity, and we're seeing this very much in evidence in the the Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. uh, struggles around the world. We've seen it in the uh, uh, 
the the populism, the the nationalism that's been rife that lay behind, uh, you know, and and the this sense of um, migrants being blamed for mm -hmm. for many problems that lay behind both Brexit and Trump being elected, yep. which were kind of surprises, but. You know that that's a genuine, serious, real problem, and it has to be confronted. So the third pole is not some warm, fuzzy place. Right. It, it recognizes the problem both of populism, identitarianism, and and the deep human requirement. I suspect uh, you will say for having an identity, for belonging, for belonging. So do you think the way the the sort of balanced way through that is to have a a nuanced view of identity that we need to have a sort of hierarchical like i can be a canadian and a universal human citizen and yeah. uh, is that is that the answer and and yeah i think that's right and i think uh, to pretend it's easy we're, you know it, it isn't easy and i i think the question of migration is probably the 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 really hard place right so you can have a sort of general view about being a global citizen and and welcoming people when canada's obviously uh, had a had a good record um, on this front, but but it it comes in conflict with with the identity and the need to belong of of many many others in the in the country that the immigrants are coming into. So yeah. this and this has to th this is not an easy problem to solve, mm -hmm. but it has to be on the table. Yeah, excellent. Well, Wendy, I, I really enjoyed this chat. It seems far too short, and I hope we get an opportunity to do it again. I'm sure we will. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.